Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. And uh, in 2009, I reported the results of a study showing that antioxidant supplements are more harmful than helpful for athletes. Not surprisingly, advocates of supplements, uh, isolated nutrient supplements, um, thought that the studies were conclusions, the conclusions were wrong and had all kinds of criticism. But a new analysis performed by one of the authors of that original study in 2009 um, has, uh, shows that, um, uh, that the findings of that study were actually correct. Antioxidant supplements are not beneficial for athletes. Dr. Troy Mary and Dr. Michael Ristow reviewed studies that looked at the effect of supplements on reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and reactive nitrogen species, or NOS. They reported that taking antioxidant supplements like vitamin C can impede the normal skeletal muscle adaptation process, which is exactly the opposite of the claims that are made about the benefits of antioxidants for athletes, um, that they reduce ROS levels from exercise. They say that while antioxidant supplements can be beneficial for things like recovery, repairing muscles, reducing fatigue, these benefits are offset by the negative effects of the supplements on things like insulin sensitivity, angiogenesis, cellular defenses, and mitochondrial function. This is particularly true for resistance and high intensity exercise, according to the authors. In other words, supplements work a lot like drugs. While there are some benefits for some drugs, they all have side effects, and the supplements work the same way. In fact, I've told many people, the supplements you have to be the most concerned about are the ones that actually work, air quotes around that for something, because you can't manipulate one function of the body without impacting other functions in the body. So if there's a beneficial effect, there's going to be a corresponding um, risk factor involved and supplements are no different than drugs. What you want to be doing is saying here are the risks and here are the benefits. Does this, does this risk benefit analysis point in the direction of using a particular supplement or not? The authors state that exercise itself has the same effect on physiology as antioxidants since exercise regulates the natural antioxidant defense system and that this effect is, quote, likely to be one of the mechanisms underlying the health promoting benefits of regular exercise. By contrast, the authors say, research shows that antioxidant supplements do not decrease the incidence of disease in humans and have been shown in some studies to increase risk. Now, I keep focusing on this word supplements because when you're consuming antioxidants and foods like fruits and vegetables, that, that's a whole different thing. We're talking about extracting those things from the food and putting them in pills. In conclusion, the authors state that Antioxidant supplementation has been consistently reported to have deleterious effects on the response to overload stress and high intensity training. Importantly, there is no convincing evidence to suggest that antioxidant supplementation enhances exercise training adaptations. So um, if you wanna be a high performing athlete, eat good food. That's basically the bottom line. Okay, something else about diet today. Let's talk about diet and sleep. Since diet affects all function, I think we can make an assumption that it has a profound effect on the quality of your sleep. Researchers say that a diet high in saturated fat and sugar results in lighter and less restorative sleep, while higher fiber, lower sugar, and lower fat diets have um, result in better sleep quality. 26 normal weight adults who didn't have sleep disorders were enrolled in a study that involves spending five nights in a sleep lab. The subject spent nine hours in bed each night from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And during that particular period of time, they were monitored with a device that measured sleep quality. For the first four days, they ate a controlled diet, and then on the fifth day, they could have whatever they wanted. Higher fiber intake was associated with less stage one or light sleep and more slow wave or deep sleep, whereas more saturated fat resulted in less slow wave sleep and higher intake of sugar was associated with more arousals. Now, the original purpose of the study was to see if sleep quality was related to obesity. Other studies have shown this connection. And so during the first phase of the study, participants were limited to four hours of sleep per night, and then their food intake was analyzed in response to uh, both shorter and longer uh, sleep sessions. And what they found, and many other studies have shown this too, 
The participants tended to overeat when they were sleep deprived and they were particularly prone to overeat higher fat foods. So the researchers then wanted to see if the reverse was true. Eating, eating fat would affect sleep quality. And of course the answer was yes, as I just stated a couple minutes ago. So one of the lead researchers wrote that the combination of short sleep sessions and poor diet result in a vicious cycle. Short sleep results in eating more fat and sugar, which re results in less quality sleep, which makes you more tired, and then you eat more fat and sugar, and so you're in a downward spiral where, spiral where health continues to decline. None of the adults in this study had a sleep disorder, and yet the effect was profound. So think about um, adding to it the idea that somebody already has a sleep problem and then it's exacerbated by the poor eating habits and that sort of thing. So the study didn't uh, seek to identify a mechanism of action, but one of the researchers stated that a heightened awareness of the reward value of food accompanies sleep deprivation and decision-making capacity is impaired by sleep deprivation. So, um, and I, I guess I can speak to that from personal experience. I'm, I'm a pretty good sleeper. Unfortunately, I've always been one of those people that doesn't need much sleep, but I'm always hungrier when I am really sleep deprived. And, um, and I think it is true that the foods that you crave when you're sleep deprived are not, uh, not necessarily the best ones for you. So the researchers stated more research is needed. That's always what they say at the end of the study, but prescribing plant-based or, or diet-based therapies for sleep disorders might be warranted. And of course, my words would be plant-based diet therapies for sleep disorders might be warranted. So to break the cycle, you eat better, and then you sleep better, and then that causes you to make better choices to eat better. So it's just the opposite of the vicious cycle that the researchers describe in their paper. All right, that's all for today and actually for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.